If this goes on, don't panic. Bringing hope to the world through speculative fiction. Hey all, welcome to this bonus episode. This year I spent some time at Worldcon interviewing a few interesting people. As I mentioned previously, these are out of chronological order. Today we have my interview with editor and interviewer Arlie Sorg. I always love talking to Arlie. He's always super insightful and has so many good recommendations. This is his second time coming onto the podcast. So here we go. All right, this is Alan. I am at Worldcon 2022. This is Saturday. I'm sitting here with Arlie Sorg, uh, co-editor of Fantasy Magazine and king of reviewers. <laughs> Arlie, how's it going? It's good. It's been really busy. I'm super tired, but it's been a good con. How about for you? Yeah, yeah. It's starting to catch up to me, all the running around, you know what I mean? I've, yes. I've barely even gotten to any of the uh, panels. <laughs> I think I've been to like two or three. I, I don't know. Sometimes that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sometimes it is. Sometimes yeah. it is. Uh, I do want to get out to the city a little bit. I've I haven't had a chance to do that much either. Yeah, Chicago's awesome. It's a great city to go sightseeing and to just lose yourself in and to be overwhelmed and inspired by and all those things. So I think that's a good idea. Yes, yes, definitely. We also want to flip off the Trump building, so that's, that's high on, our, on our, our list. I've scowled several times walking by. <laughs> <laughs> um, so last time you and I were chatting, uh, um, you were just kicking off Fantasy Magazine yeah. with Christy Yant. Uh, how are things going? They're great. Um, you know, when we started it, we weren't totally sure what it would look like, what shape it would take. And uh, even now, if people ask us to describe the magazine, it's hard to describe in any specific way. Mm -hmm. uh, but we really enjoy what we're doing. We're very proud of what we're doing. Um, we put out some amazing work. And we're really grateful to work with a lot of the authors that, that we get to work with. Awesome. Awesome. And so generally, you guys publish, just so our audience who may not have read it know, uh, you, you always have some short fiction in there. There's usually some poetry. Yeah. Um, you usually have some nonfiction in there as well. Yes. It's a pretty good mix of all of those things. Yeah. Well, first of all, how dare they not read it? <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> I'm shaking my fist at them. Exactly. We run uh, two poems, two flash pieces, two short stories in every issue, and then uh, a mix of interviews and nonfiction, uh, mostly the nonfiction is essays that I commission from people that I just think are interesting or they might say something interesting and I'm like, hey, do you want to expand on that? I will yeah. pay you money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And it's cool because we've run a couple things that I feel like, you know, we can provide a space where they might not be able to write the same kind of thing at other places. Um, Vita Cruz's essay comes to mind about non-traditional narratives. And we have a couple other things coming up. Meg Ellison did some really cool um essays about Stephen King and, and yeah and it's great because she loves Stephen King and she knows a lot about it so it's not just a bunch of random things they're very uh, very knowledgeable very well structured very well informed critical essays you yeah. know that are like yeah King's awesome but check these things out so yeah and we sometimes do like genre pieces like Effie Cyberg had a piece about called how to how to steal a million dragons and it was basically talking about heist fiction yeah yeah so a great mix of stuff awesome awesome yeah do you feel like you're where you want to be with the magazine right now well <clears throat> that's an interesting question uh in terms of what we're putting out we're definitely where we want to be there are some behind behind the scenes things that um you know, we don't respond to submissions as quickly as we would want to. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Some of it is our process. Some of it is that we both have full-time jobs. Yeah. Um, and some of it is uh, just that life has thrown both of us a lot of challenges lately over the past couple of years, really. It's been a really challenging couple of years. 
Um, so in terms of some of the nuts and bolts behind the scenes, there are things that are not ideal. Yeah. But in terms of what the magazine is, that is definitely where we want it to be. Excellent, excellent. I can completely relate to all of that stuff. <laughs> I swear the last couple of years have been super challenging. I know I personally yeah. have been having some health issues this whole summer. It's just been like oh, yeah. ongoing, endless health issues. So <laughs> I can completely relate to that kind of thing. Yeah. I think challenges have been, you know, uh, liberally spread around, yes. basically. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, in the perfect situation, you know, how would you see fantasy magazine expanding or, or moving forward maybe is a better way to put right. it. Right. Well, you know, a lot in terms of expanding, that's really about budget, which is about money, you know, nothing else. Um, the more subscribers we get, the more advertising we can get, the more advertising we can get, that becomes a possibility for buying more work or for you know, running different kinds of things. Uh, right now, we are not in a position to think about it. If we had, if we had more money, we could buy more stories, we could buy more poetry or whatever, or we could um, add other components potentially. And it would be cool to expand. It would be cool to have more slots, basically. Um, but that comes down to money. In terms of direction, we're happy with the direction. Uh, so, you know, we just want to be able to continue doing what we're already doing. And, uh, you know, we got, for the second year in a row, we're World Fantasy Award finalists for our work as editors. One of our pieces is on the ballot as well. We got a Locus. We were a Locus finalist. Um, I was given some other stuff. Uh, a lot of our work has been reprinted in years best or given great reviews. Um, an, a piece from our original issue was on the NAMO Awards list. So there's a lot of just different kinds of acknowledgement mm -hmm. um, in different corners of genre and the genre community that we really appreciate that kind of signals that we're doing something right. Yeah. You know, the readers are there, people are enjoying what we're doing. So yeah, the direction is good, <laughs> but <laughs> the expansion would be great, you know, yeah, but yeah. that's about money. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's always good to hear. Um, it, so you mentioned the, uh, your most recent world fantasy nomination yeah. by uh, Seb Dubinsky and uh, Eugene Bacon, which yeah. I, I love both of those writers. I am yeah. particular, particularly fond of Seb Dubinsky myself in the, um, the story that is called the, the failing name. Yes. We off the books were chatting about it a little bit yesterday, yeah. and I just wanted to give you opportunity if, if there's anything you wanted to say about that story in particular, like um, why is it such a great story? Yeah, well, it's a challenging story. It's a daring story. Yes. Um, it's a hard to read story on an emotional level. Yes, but it's also a brilliant story, and it it really, you know, even though there are difficult things to talk about. They, you know, that story is talking about things that are real and it's talking about them in a very real, very uh, upfront um, way. But it's also applying a speculative element to it to sort of bring it to another level. And so I think, you know, I think more stories like this need to be written. More stories like this need to be acknowledged. Um, you know, it's not an easy story, but it's done right. And uh, yeah, I was surprised that it was on the ballot. Yeah, I, you know, I, I read it and, and I can see exactly why you say that. I mean, it's, well, first of all, the main theme I would say is loneliness. You know, it's all about loneliness and how lonely the main character is throughout um, their life and all of the things that happen to them to create that loneliness, right? I, I, I mean, I would say it's more about violence and in particular mm -hmm. violence against women, but also just yes. viol violence against vulnerable people. Like it opens with violence. Yes. You know, the main character witnesses violence and the main character kind of doesn't know what to do. And that, that points to the fact that a lot of times we are in these situations where we just don't know what to do. Yeah. You know, in terrible situations when we should be able to do something, but we, but we're stuck. We're scared ourselves and the violence bleeds over into our lives. And then the main character is taken into these situations where ostensibly their life should be transformed in wonderful ways. And it just gets worse mm -hmm. and they become the victims of violence, you know, and abuse. And, you know, they have to, 
survive and uh, they survive through resilience and through imagination. And, you know, this speaks to, I mean, it speaks to things that really happen. And I haven't seen a lot of stories that talk about uh, the things that happen in this story and the way that they happen. It speaks to the immigrant immigrant experience, for example, and the vulnerability of immigrant populations. You know, it also is about um, just generally the way that our cultures commit violence on people, get away with it, and how many people in our lives, how many people around us are basically existing by virtue of their resilience and their inner strength, and they're never acknowledged, you know? Yes, yes. Um, And this kind of stuff happens all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, uh, and, and that was a much more articulate way of describing it than I could ever could have. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, I think I think structurally it was pretty challenging too. I yes. Mean, uh, it kind of skipped back and forth between perspectives, and then the end yeah. was a completely different perspective than yes. the whole entire rest of the story. Yeah. It structurally it's challenging, and it makes you uncomfortable, and yes. it you know. It unsettles you, um, and I think that that's part of the magic of the story. Like yeah. even the structure reflects what the narrative is doing yeah. and talking about. Yeah, you know. I would love to talk to Seb and Eugene just to get like a feel for how they put that together. I'm more familiar with Seb's work, but I have read some of Eugene's work too, and it yeah. just seems like such a difference, especially for Seb. I mean, it's just very different direction than yeah. I-, I would see him going. You know. Well, Seb has commented on Twitter and stuff that this is really Eugene's story and that he chimed in on it, basically. Oh, and, and I, haven't I can di- see that. Yeah, I haven't directly asked them, uh, so I almost hesitate to speak, but that's basically what he's intimated on Twitter. Right. Yeah. I, could, I can see that. I can see that. It's definitely see more her style, but yeah, I would, I would like to, to hear them talk about that. But that is yeah. not about you. That is about them. <laughs> so let's bring it back to you. Um so we talked about the magazine stuff. Let's talk yeah. about the, the king of interviewing part of your life. Okay. <laughs> you, uh, as I've mentioned in the past, you interview for so many different things. You interview yeah. for yourself. You interview for Locus. You interview for Clark's World. Yeah. And um, for fantasy. And for fantasy. Yeah. Yes. Um, if, if saying for yourself and for fantasy to me is almost like... <laughs> almost like, the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, what keeps you interviewing folks you know you must be pretty busy with your job at locus and running a magazine and all this other stuff that you're doing well uh the clarksville thing is that i really enjoy being involved with clarksville that's what that's about you know and then uh and it's great because i get to interview some really cool people i won't say that i like everybody equally or that i'm interested in everybody equally sometimes it's like a job is a job kind of thing but sometimes i'm like oh this is great i'm so glad i get to chat with this person yeah um locus is kind of similar you know like i don't i get to suggest people or uh dialogue with the editor-in-chief at locus about who we're going to interview and who's doing what So I won't say that I am without choice or influence, uh, but sometimes a job is a job and sometimes it's like, oh, cool, I'm so glad we get to do this, you know. And sometimes it was my idea, which is cool. Uh, So it's great because I get to have an impact on genre in that way. And I really enjoy that. I really enjoy um, creating a dialogue between uh, the people I'm interviewing and the readers. You know, and I see my goal as trying to get both sides to understand each other. And I always hope to ask questions that will interest and engage the authors as well as interest and engage the reader. And for my own site, um, you know, and there's also a lot of uh, personal agenda involved. You know, there's always Mm -hmm. choices about what I'm going to ask, how I'm going to ask it and stuff. But for my own site, uh, I see those as more casual interviews, and I make all the decisions there. I can interview whoever I want. And um, that started as, it's called At The Bar, and it's at arleysorg.com. And that started as, you know, during pandemic, I was missing uh, hanging out with people at the bar. Yeah. And so the idea was doing interviews with people that I kind of know already and want to hang out with. Maybe I had met them once and, you know, we had done that thing where we were like, oh, we should get a drink sometime. Or maybe, you know, we've hung out a few times or maybe we're friends. But that was the premise. 
So most of the people at, for at the bar are people that I know. Yeah. There are a couple of exceptions because I was like, oh, it'd be really cool to interview this person. Devon Saunders is a great example. Like I had never met Devon, mm-hmm. hadn't had a lot of interactions with him. He's the uh, editor at FIA okay. magazine. At, but I was like, you know, you know, and I make deliberate decisions about like my website isn't going to get huge traffic, but it is a platform and it creates a little bit more visibility for someone. And I was like, Devon deserves to be seen. You know, and FIA deserves to be seen and what they're doing deserves to be seen. So even if it's like 10 more people know about them, that's great. It's 10 more people, you know, and uh, and I try to do those interviews in a way I send them an email and I try to come up with interesting questions that are some of them are a little bit different, a little bit more casual. And I basically tell them in the email, you can talk about whatever you want. You don't have to answer these questions. You know, if you don't like the question, talk about anything you want, you know, or take the question in any direction you want, because I really want that to be a place where, you know, like a lot of times people get interview after interview after interview and they get asked the same dumb questions or they never get a chance to talk about things they really don't want to talk about. Or if they're people of color, they get asked questions that are kind of racist you know, um, or, you know, homophobic, if it's queer, whatever it is. So I really enjoy doing that in that space and being able to highlight people that I want to highlight for what it's worth. And fantasy is similar, but, you know, there I have to think about, like with my website, it's really just whoever the hell I want. Right, right. But with fantasy, I have to think about what is good for the magazine as well. Right. You know, so there is an element of what will help sell issues. But I also apply the same idea of who needs to be seen, um, what kind of voices do I want to uh, give a platform to. You know, so I interviewed S.L. Huang, I interviewed N.K. Jameson, I interviewed Charlie Jean Anders, I interviewed um, lots of really interesting, cool people. But you're not going to see the people who traditionally get tons and tons of coverage anyway in the industry, you know. Yeah. Who have historically dominated the industry anyways I, mean, I totally totally understand yeah. that struggle because i try to do the same thing you know it's a mix between okay can i get some bigger names on to attract more yeah. attention and get more listeners to the podcast but exactly. then also you know i want to i want to bring in people who i just find interesting that maybe nobody knows you know what i mean or and yeah. i'm also as we were talking about before we even start recording you know yeah. i'm interested in bringing um, um new people on new writers yeah. you know what i mean and and just seeing what they're about you know yeah. Um, I totally get that. Totally yeah. My le- my recent interview was uh, the top 10 uh, Locust Word fantasy finalists. So I did an interview with the top 10 Locust Word fantasy finalists. Um, and it's a group interview. I gave them all 10 questions. I said, please answer whichever seven you want at minimum. You can answer all of them if you want. And here's the thing about it, though. Uh, if this was 10 years ago... I would not have done that interview because uh-huh. it would have all been, you know, white people. Yeah. But this year's ballot is super diverse. Yeah. And so I'm like, this could be really cool. You know, this is a great group of people. Yeah. And our magazine is Fantasy Magazine. And, you know, they are at the forefront of fantasy fiction. So let's talk to them about what fantasy is and what it means to them and how they apply it to their work, you know? So I thought that would be really cool. Yeah, that's a cool know? idea. I love it. Yeah. You almost verged on answering this question already. Who's on your interview <laughs> bucket list that you haven't already spoken to? Uh, I don't know. I mean, there have been a couple times when I reached out to people for interviews and it didn't happen, but I wouldn't necessarily call it a bucket list. I feel like, I mean, because it's all about timing, it's all about what's already happened in the mag. So I don't know. And it changes from month to month and year to year, sure. you know, but I had NK Jameson early. And if, if I hadn't had uh, Nora, it would have been Nora, you know, other than that, like, it's like, there's just so many cool people out there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it comes down to what's happening because you ideally for an interview, you also want to run it um, when they have something coming up. Right. You know, like uh, Nora happened to have a book coming up, I think, or recently out, because ideally it benefits the author more if they have a project either coming up or recently right. out. 
so that, um, you know, it's mutual. It's Especially like, someone with that high profile, you know, with N.K. Yeah. Jemison, you know what I mean? She doesn't have to do interviews if she doesn't yeah. want to because everybody knows who she is. No, she know? doesn't need to, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. But, I mean, maybe it sold 10 more copies or maybe it reached someone who didn't know about her for whatever bizarre reason, right. you know. Right. But, yeah, I mean, <laughs> but she's cool. She did the interview, you know. I emailed her and she was like, sure, <laughs> you know. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, and Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, same thing. Like, I don't think she needed to do the interview. She didn't have to do it. She did it. I was grateful. Um uh, maybe it got 10 more readers or maybe somebody saw something to give context to her work that they didn't see somewhere else, you know, whatever it was. Hopefully it's mutually beneficial in some way. That's yeah. that's ultimately my goal, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I know I, I sometimes I'm self-limiting in who I reach out to because I feel like there's no way, you know what I mean? Yeah. But um, it's it, I just love pushing the boundary and then getting somebody to actually say, yeah, sure, yeah, oh, come on. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I, I randomly emailed uh, Ellen Datlow, and she's like, yeah, I'll come on. Yeah. yeah. So I'm interviewing her tomorrow, and I was like, nice. oh, okay, awesome. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes all you got to do is ask. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. All right, so time to wrap it up. I've had you for a lot of amount of time already. <laughs> um, one question that we ask everybody who comes on to the podcast, okay. you have definitely answered it once, but it was a few years ago, so it's maybe it's changed now. Yeah. What is bringing you hope right now? Oh, uh, what is bringing me hope right now? Um, seeing, being here at Worldcon and seeing so many authors and other creators of color who are here at this event, thriving, doing well, meeting each other, creating community, and putting out awesome work. That's yeah. giving me hope. I gotta say, I was talking to Maurice Brodus last night. Yeah. Man, that guy has a lot of stuff coming out. I'm not gonna get he him does. on the podcast. He does. We were talking about that last night. So, audience... Hopefully, Maurice Brodus will be on uh, probably in the next six months because we're pretty we're pretty scheduled out right now. <laughs> Hopefully, early twenty twenty three. I interviewed him for Locus. Yeah, 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 it was good. Yeah, he's a good guy. Oh, he's he's hilarious. He, he's, yeah. he's great. Yeah, he's, he's so easy to talk to and uh, very witty and, and just a fun guy. Yeah. yeah. What do you have coming out right now that you want to promote? Uh, mainly just the stuff. Well, I guess we talked about most of it, but you know, fantasy magazine. Interviews in Clark's World. I have the column in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, otherwise known as FNSF. I have my own website, arlysort.com, you know, and Locus. So that's the, that's the, it's continual. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. And um, where can folks find you? Uh, arlysort.com is the easiest place uh, because all the other stuff that I do, you can find through that site. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here and uh, spending time with you and the energy and intention and thoughtfulness. Thank you. Oh, thank you. you. Appreciate it.